I mean, yesterday I witnessed, I got so upset with my, you know, faulty biological background, microbiology background, that I put out photos of Sabin and Salk and of people in those polio cans from the 1950s and the 1940s. Is the president on the campaign trail once again belittled your world? How do we push back and say that science matters? I think we just have to keep telling people about what, how human life has improved because of science and scientists, because of work by Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, because of work of people like Anthony Fauci. And, and I think it's obvious to anybody that looks at the, the reason why we have lifespans of 70s and 80s, and then looks back at the work that science and medicine has done with vaccination, with public health. I don't think that this is a disputable type of thing. And to hear the president call Dr. Fauci or allude to him as being quote unquote an idiot really just shows that he has complete envy for somebody like Dr. Fauci, who has real credentials and has a real track record and has expertise that he will never gain. And I think that's that, that's what we have to think about. This is very nihilistic to keep going after science and experts, because it is science that will get us through this pandemic. And it has been the ignoring of science that has led to over 200,000 deaths in the United States. So this is really deplorable uh, from the president. When we distribute a vaccine, and we know that the first one will not be as efficacious as the second the third, the fourth tranche. We may need boosters like when we were kids, et cetera. What should be the approach to give confidence on a successful first vaccine? The approach is to make sure that this whole process has been insulated from political considerations, that this doesn't become hydroxychloroquine or this doesn't become convalescent plasma, that we know that the FDA is going through the exact measures that they would for any other vaccine. And it's going to be important also for professional societies like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Infectious Disease Society of America, as well as people like Dr. Fauci to really be behind this vaccine and tell the American people very transparently what the risks are, what the benefits are, so that they have confidence. Because if we don't get enough people vaccinated, we are still going to be dealing with hospitals getting ho patients that they can't handle and continue to have this kind of limbo of this pan of pandemic control. So we have to be very clear and do a lot of public health detailing to the American public. Because if you go back to 2009 and H1N1 during that pandemic, only about 23% of Americans got that vaccine. We can't have a failure like that. We need to get confidence in the public. And in order to do that, we've got to make sure that these steps have actually been fallen, fo followed. And I do think the pharmaceutical company CEOs, as well as Monsef Slui from Operation Warp Speed, have, have increased my confidence that this will be something that doesn't get meddled with the way hydroxychloroquine did. Dr. Adalta, in the meantime, as we wait for a vaccine, any parent out there is juggling whether we're going back to remote school, whether their kids are going to see their friends, what is the appropriate level of so social interaction? And this matters, frankly, especially as an increasing number of kids feel isolated and depressed, and this affects their social development. What is the appropriate level of contact at this point, taking into consideration these mental health issues at a time when a lot of science experts are saying, hey, all of these small gatherings, these, these groups of, of playdates, they're not acceptable. Is, this is something that's a very hard question to answer, and a lot of it has to do with your risk tolerance and who in the household has risk factors for severe disease. I do think that there is a real psychosocial toll that this pandemic has been playing on children who are unable to socialize, who are unable to have in-person learning, and we have to prioritize that. Thankfully, children still tend to be spared from the worst consequences of this disease. They're not likely to be hospitalized, not likely to die, and even the younger ones, less than sixth grade and below, are probably less likely to spread it. So I do think that children uh, can and socialize in small groups with, with the caveat that you're making sure that no one there is at least overtly sick and that you take notice of, of the fact that you're going to be at a little bit of a higher risk. But I do think in some situations, you have to look at what the value is being pursued and, and, my, and social interaction is a real value and look at the risk. And it's going to be a little bit different for each person in each family, but I think that there are ways to do this safely. And I do think we have to prioritize getting this outbreak un under control and having schools open in person, because if we can have fans and stadiums, uh, we need to be able to have children in schools. Doctor, when we talk about the economy and try and address one issue, often what happens is we cause problems elsewhere. And I appreciate, before I ask this question, how challenging it is to explore with me. But what are we learning about the medical issues we're causing elsewhere as we try and tackle this specific one? We definitely know that when hospitals 
at, were, were asked to stop with their quote unquote elective procedures. And elective procedures is kind of a bad word because people think cosmetic, but elective means things like scheduled aortic valve surgery. And we know that there's an inc that, that all of those other medical conditions did have increased morbidity and mortality. We know vaccinations dropped uh, during the height of the economic shutdowns. We know that uh, cancer chemotherapies were delayed. We, we know that psychiatric care also uh, kind of went through the cracks, felt, everything fell through the cracks during that shutdown. So we have to balance, not, not just balance it, but realize that we have to think long-term. It's just so hard for policymakers in the middle of a crisis to think long-term, even though that's what they should have been doing, knowing that we can't trade short-term benefits for COVID against long-term uh, long-term uh, problems with cancer and other diseases. So I do think that this is something that people recognized, and that's why it's so important that we have hospital capacity and that we expand hospital capacity and make sure hospitals have enough resources, because if they can't do their ordinary care for heart disease, for cancer, for surgeries, for, for pediatric and psychiatric care, we're going to suffer long-term consequences. And I think that no one wants to make those same mistakes again.